brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to another episode of the Badminton Podcast, proudly sponsored by Volantwear, the brand that gives the world the most versatile badminton apparel because we love badminton. The whole podcast is about building our badminton community and helping all badminton players, fans and people who play to grow in their lives and in their sport as well. We're currently in Malaysia right now for the Malaysia Masters, um, January 2020. And today we'll be joined by Joshua Hulbert Yu from Canada. I forgot to tell everyone that usually Henry is on with me. So I'm Jeff and usually Henry is on with me co-hosting for this podcast. But because we are in Kuala Lumpur for the Malaysia Masters 2020, we have a very special co-host, Gronya Somerville. And I know that a lot of people are familiar with her name. Take it away, Gronya. Hi, guys. So today we're here with Joshua Hulbert Yu from Canada, who we'll be interviewing. He is currently ranked 29 in the world for mixed doubles with Josephine Wu. He's a Canadian national champion, Pan Am Games champion, as well as a bunch of international titles under his belt. Finding ways to enjoy the sport. I think no matter what in life, you just have to enjoy it. I think if you're always so down about stuff, you're not gonna enjoy doing anything. I think enjoying it makes you wanna come back and do it do it again. You are not going to get along with everyone in the world, right? But you have to just find a way to make things work and just respect their way of life and how they were brought up. And hopefully in the end, they can respect the way that you were brought up and, you know, the way you are as a person. He loves that badminton gives him the opportunity to travel the world because he loves meeting new people from different cultures, preferably the ones that can't speak English. So what does that kind of mean? Uh, so I kind of just enjoy, you know, not speaking English when I kind of like leave Canada because I'm always speaking English. So it's nice to just like go out and just like talk to people that like kind of don't really know English and then kind of like, cause I could speak Mandarin and a bit of Cantonese. So it's nice to just go out and just like only speak Mandarin or something like that. So I just really like pushes like my brain to like, you know, try to like learn Mandarin and stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. So you were saying that you actually enjoy it when you can't communicate with them much at all. Yeah. yeah what yeah. do you mean by that? Uh, it's just interesting. Cause it's always like, it's always fun because, uh, I always have a good time communicating with people that don't speak English. It's weird. Cause you'll just be like, Oh, uh, you know, I'm trying to go here or something. And they're like, haha, that's funny. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 and it's always like a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do you try and yeah. use the app or anything or it's all just like, yeah, it's, it's hand the, like, it, signs yeah, hand signs, maybe some Google translate, but it's always like, it's always fun. Like, yeah. you know, if you always just speak English to someone, Hey, can I get here? Like, okay. Yeah, it's here. Like mm. that's, you know, it's like pretty simple, but yeah. But you like the challenge of not being able to speak. Yes. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, just wanted to say, first of all, though, after delving into that little love of yours, um, welcome onto the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So as Gonya said, we're here in Malaysia and we're here live. So we're doing this live together with Josh. He's sitting right next to me and he's a big boy. Like he's not a big boy as in he's, he's like really fit, but he's tall and he needs a bit of leg room. And we're actually quite bunched in together here for this podcast recording. He's asking us to back off a little bit because he, he needs a bit of space. So let's give him a, a little bit of love because uh, it, it's your first podcast. Yeah. First ever. So you, you'll do fine. It'll be just a fun chat. Yeah. <laughs> so Josh, we're here because we love badminton and that's what the listeners want to hear about badminton. And we're really interested to hear your story because with your surname as well, you've got some Chinese in you as well as what's the other part? Uh, so the other part is German, but my dad got a name change when his mom remarried to another guy, to an English guy. So the last name is Herberts, which is English, but his name before was actually Schlechter. So oh, wow. my name would have been Schlechter, Schlechter U. U, but okay. in instead now it's Herbert U. Okay. Yeah. Great. And what's your badminton story? Uh, so I started badminton at a very young age. Uh, both my parents actually met through badminton. So they played badminton, they met each other and then, you know, that, one, yeah. That's a common finding with a lot of guests in the, on the badminton podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so many people meet through badminton. Yeah. Gronya as well. So 
you and Micah have been together from badminton. Mm. I'm the only one that's not in, in a relationship <laughs> relating to badminton, but there's plenty of them out there. So, yeah. sorry, keep going. Okay, so yeah, they, they met through badminton and then that's how they, you know, you know, came together. And then, so growing up, I actually liked playing a lot of sports. Uh, I actually really liked soccer, m mostly, but I also played like whatever I could. Just like going outside and just, you know, just going outside and just playing sports. Didn't like to stay inside that much. But it wasn't uh, until like my mom brought me into badminton and she kind of just like saw me hit a little bit. And she said like, okay, like, you know, like you have potential to actually do something with this. So then she like cut me out out of like all other sports. It were was, you, yeah. Were you angry? I was sad. I was, <laughs> I was so sad. Cause like, I love soccer. I remember this one time in primary school, which is like when I was around like nine or 10, I was in the soccer team and we were going to go play like semifinals of this, like, of the like tournament and stuff. And then she drove to the game to pick me up to bring me to training oh, no. and then like and then like i was trying to like I tell my uh soccer coach like please just let me just talk to her and just like let me stay <laughs> you know <laughs> just stuff like that and then like she's like okay I, you know, I got you and then he would go and talk to her but my mom is yeah is she a mom. bit of a tiger mom yes that's what i was about to say she's a much of a tiger mom so i was like all right i'll just i'll just go so then yeah i just just like kind of like at the beginning i didn't really enjoy badminton because i was kind of forced onto it but yeah. luckily i had a lot of friends that played because uh when i actually went to summer school and then i met friends there and then we went to go to a badminton club and then i saw them there and i was like oh hey like you know like you know like uh I you saw play you. too yeah so, yeah <laughs> you play too basically and i would just play with them all the time only because of friends not because i actually yeah, yeah. like badminton because Every time I did play badminton, my mom was always there, always watching me, always telling me how to like get better and stuff. Okay, I was like, yeah. mom, just let me have fun, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, that's kind of like the beginning. Growing up training, I actually, a lot of coaches didn't like me because I feel like I was like the type that just like did not want to listen. Like I just wanted to do my own thing all the time. So if somebody would tell me go do footwork, they'd like say like front back footwork, I would just do side to side. <laughs> and I, yeah, just like mess around with like, just like do whatever <laughs> I want, you know, and not care. And the coaches would just like, just like yell at me and I would just like not even listen to them. I would just oh. keep doing it. But then same You're with, like biggest nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was one of those kids who just like they like coaches hated me like so much. Uh so like maybe like the first so I started when I was eight and then like the first three years I, I played, like no coach would coach me, not even my mom. My mom would like would like yell at me and then I would just like not listen to her. Cause like she would just like yell at me and then I would just be like, No, I don't wanna I don't wanna play this. I would just like throw my racket and just like leave. I just be like I don't wanna do this. It wasn't until like I was 11 and I found uh, my first coach that actually, you know, knew how to discipline me kind of thing. And his name was Koki Chen. He was from Malaysia and he came to Toronto to coach at my club. And yeah, like w once I started to like listen to him and he knew how to like discipline me, he knew how to like make kind of like the sport fun for me and also like like a father figure kind of thing to me. And he would like tell me like, hey, like, look, I know you like to have fun, but like, you know, you could really be good at the sport. You got to like learn how to like, you know, incorporate the fun and but also train properly and stuff like that. So he was actually the first one that really understood me to like a deeper level, not like the other coaches who would just yell at me, like not really care about anything else. So through him, uh, I kind of figure out more about myself and how to kind of get better, but also have fun kind of thing. So, yeah, that's basically how I started. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting because we come back to some other episodes, for example, was, there was an episode with Stuart Rollins and we were talking about how to be a good coach and how mm. to find the best coach for you. And we found that a lot of people think that the best coach is always the one that's best technically, who mm. can teach you technique. Mm -hmm. But then we were talking about having to, have the coach having to understand the person mm -hmm. as a person yeah. rather than just as the sport. Yes. And all of a sudden you start listening to him. Mm -hmm. So it's about incorporating a bit of fun. And that also comes back to the episode with Hans Christian Wittinghus, where we were talking about the Danish system and how someone was asking Victor Axelsen and he wrote a post about it on Facebook about the importance of private training when they're really young. And Victor replied and said, no, just have fun because mm -hmm. that's how people stay in the sport and that's why you start playing. Yeah. And I think when you talk about the training and ha having him tell you why you're actually doing it, not just do it, but mm -hmm. why, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, wow, that's mm -hmm. why I'm doing it. I'm mm -hmm. actually going to do it now. Yeah. I think like with coaches that, you know, have a whole – variety of people within the squad it's so important to have those people skills where they can kind of figure out what each person needs and the best way that they learn and the best way that that athlete is like taking in information and responding to improving and getting the best out of them yeah so after like my first coach i had him for maybe around two years and then 
I switched to another coach because he left my club. And then that's when like my badminton went downhill again because uh, my next coach didn't really understand me. And I was also like still kind of the same kind of person. Same attitude. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. have the same attitude, but I was a bit better. Like before when I was a kid, I would just, if they asked me to do like drop in net, I would just do smash and clear <laughs> or something. But at least now I would like at least do the drill, but yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it that well. <laughs> I would, yeah, exactly. But I would just still kind of have fun with it and like mess around. Like they would do like, oh, you have to do like an inside out spin. But, but I would just like do this fake or something like that. Like, you know, just like mess around still. Just like, you know, I really like to like just be outside of the box, not always like be contained. So yeah, at least I was a bit better, but still, still had like a attitude problem, I guess. So then, yeah, it was like that up until maybe around... I was last year. No. <laughs> yeah. Six months ago. Yeah, six months ago. Literally last year, like 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 one week ago. <laughs> so then, uh, up until I was around like sixteen, so I didn't really take the sport seriously. It wasn't until I there was this one guy that I grew up playing with, kind of, and I used to beat him all the time. And I won't say his name, but I'm pretty sure you know who he is. And he beat me all the time. And then, sorry, sorry, I beat him all the time. And then there was one point in time out of nowhere, he beat me and he smoked me like, like under like 10 in both games. And then I got roasted by my friends. And on top of that, he roasted me. He's like, you're so bad now. And, <laughs> and this is like, just got me like so fired up. I was like, and then after that, something like clicked into my head and I just, I just trained so hard after that. And then ever since that day, I like love the sport. <laughs> oh, really? I don't know why, but that's what triggered it. So like, you're not going to drop the name? So I, the, the name is something good though because you can say, <laughs> "Hey, this person made me the person I am right now." <laughs> Maybe he doesn't want to give them that credit. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'll say the I'll say the name. His uh, his name was uh, Andrew D'Souza. Oh, really? Oh, I know yeah, him. you know him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we grew up. We played doubles together. Played singles, and I used to always beat him when he first started. And then I, I remember one year in uh, under nineteen. Yeah, we played a tournament at this uh, Granite. It's called like the Toronto Junior Open. Played it, and I. And I played him and he just like completely spanked me. And then like my friends, like I said, just roasted me. He's like, you didn't even get like one game in total with, with, both, <laughs> your points. Yeah, with both your points combined and stuff. And then like he, and then ever since that day, like he was also like very cocky towards me. But the nice thing is, is that like a couple years later, uh, like we were okay. Like even now he's, he like messaged me the other day saying like, oh, like, you know, like good job on like your, your run yeah, and nice. stuff. And then just like keep going at it and stuff like that, which is nice. Cause yeah, I, I think the reason why we kind of like stopped like being because we were actually really good friends and stopped being friends because uh, we, we used to play doubles together, but then we kind of split because my coach wanted me to play with someone from my club, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So then I think he made, got a little bitter and then, you know, trying to have like a vendetta against me and just like beat me in singles. But mm -hmm. yeah, he's actually the one. I still remember that day. I still remember that tournament the next day, literally the Monday after. I went to training and I was like, look, like I'm, I'm serious. Like I told my coach, like I'm serious right now. Did, I want to like. Did they believe you? <laughs> no, like I, I, I was like, no. Was what's funny? Like, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, what's, what's yeah. funny was like my my when I told my coach, he's just like so surprised because I was I would go into training just like you know mess around all the time, but I like came and I was like, no, like I know I've been messing around, like just like I'm, I'm gonna train seriously, and I know you're not gonna believe me, but like I'm gonna do I'm it, gonna I'm gonna show, it. yeah. So like the the first week I did it, after like maybe like a uh, couple like first week couple trainings and then i was just like i didn't say anything to him i just trained and i and i was like so serious and he's just like what the hell's going on like, he's like <laughs> you know you can see like on his face he's like he's like is this guy okay <laughs> first week happens same thing second week still training hard third week and then one month later he comes up to me he's like okay you're serious and he's just like yeah i was like before he would offer to give me like free private lessons and stuff and i would always say no but i was like are you like i would ask him like are you still up to like give me private lessons like i'm really taking this seriously now so then I did that and then he was like really shocked like he's just like I was like in his private lesson and I was really listening to him and stuff like that like I was like kind of like a new person I wasn't so reliant on someone being compatible with like yeah, for yeah, me yeah. as a coach he but more as I'm trying to be compatible for them. yeah, for yeah, them. yeah. and then that's what another thing I learned uh through that lesson was like you know you can only change yourself you cannot change the person that is like you know across from you right nice. so i realized like you know like okay he's like this type of person he likes to really he's more like analytical so i'm like, okay if he's more analytical then i can really use that towards my game right so then i tried being more of like a smarter player from him right so it gets more intense because after that uh and then i played him again at another at another tournament and i still lost but it was decently close i lost to the Sousa. and this time i could see that he had more respect for me which is nice so then and this was all singles? Yeah, this is all yeah. singles. So like, I could tell, like, uh, I played him again. And then like, this time I, I got like, I think it was like 19 and 17. So it was like decently close. And I could see that he was like, he had more respect and stuff. 
So then I was like, you know what, it's not enough. So I dropped school and I moved to China to train. What age is this? I was at 17. So what, what yeah. age was the first switch when you switched on and said, I want to do this? Uh, 16. 16. Yeah, 16. So, yeah, 16. And then I was like, I was like, I really want to take this seriously. So I went to, I went to China and I trained and I just like basically went full time uh, for like around like four, four months first. And then I came back to play some tournaments and then I went back again for another four months. And China was like such an eye opener because that was that was where like my mom was like bred. Like, and she would always tell me growing up, like, you know, your training's too easy, you know, <laughs> the stuff like, oh yeah, you guys got it too easy. You guys only train like two, three times a week, only two, two hours and stuff like that. Like, you know, this is like, this is nothing, you know, it's like, you know what we used to do back in the day? And I'd always tell like, mama, I don't want to hear it. Okay. I've heard this story many times. <laughs> it wasn't until I actually went, holy, she wasn't lying. The <laughs> training was crazy there. It was, it was intense. It was like, you'd start at six and run around the track, do some like stretching and stuff, have breakfast go and train singles for like three and a half hours, go eat, take a nap, and then weight training and like footwork or like running in the jungle, just like crazy stuff. And you were just like always running. It was crazy. And then I would like, there were some days when uh, training would finish at like maybe like 5.30 or six. And then at six o'clock, I would just die. Like I would just go <laughs> to my bed, sleep for 12 hours, wake up again at six for the next train. Like I wouldn't do anything. Like my friends would ask me, hey, do you want to come out and like maybe, you know, go to the internet cafe or just like, you know, go eat or something. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll catch you later. Let me take a nap. Wake up 12 <laughs> hours later. Like that's how tired I was. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. Were your parents both like high level players? Uh, like internationally? No, my, both my parents didn't really, uh, weren't able to like kind of get to that level. Okay. I, th I don't think like they, like my dad played in Canada. But he was never like a top player, but he was also like, he was like, just like, just on the cusp of it. Mm. Also, my mom was like, uh, she was part of like the Guangdong team. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But then also could not like get to like, maybe like the national team. Yeah, sure. Stuff like that. So I think that also plays a part into why they are so supportive of me. Because they see that I'm like playing internationally and I'm doing like decent. So that they like, you know, they're really supporting me. Like, uh, especially like going into the Olympics, they're like, 100% just yeah. like go for it like please do it like you know like you know you they really support it which is really nice does your mom watch your matches and oh, comment all the time like, we should have done that why are you doing this yeah she, yeah so she's what i love about her is that she's so honest like she's <laughs> like you played like garbage like yeah, you know it's like you did not play well like don't like because like uh sometimes like uh sh she's so serious to a point where like it's like, I'm like, oh, that's kind of hurt, you know, like, <laughs> but I was like, you know what? Like, I, I like that she's honest, but like yeah. at the beginning when she first told me, she's like, she's like, you're going to play like this. I, I like, you really want to make Olympics and stuff like that. Like, you're not going to do it. Like you got to train harder and stuff like that, which is really nice. Like she always says like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't like to give you pressure. But as soon as like she watches my game yes. and then afterwards, she just gives me like all the pressure in the world, which is nice. I, I like it because uh, I think pressure is a good thing really helps you like uh, train harder and like, you know, take it more seriously. Cause if you just have no pressure and you just kind of like lay back all the time, you won't like, you know, I feel like you won't be pushed to like your, yeah. you know, your potential. So yeah. three, four months in China the first time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you went back to Canada. Yeah, I went back to Canada and I, I played some tournaments and then uh, I realized, so that was like kind of like my last year in juniors. So I just like played and then also played Pan Am games sorry, Pan Am, like junior Pan Ams. And I actually did okay in that one. I actually was, I only qualified for mixed, which is funny. And I played with uh, Brittany Tam and that was kind of like my first international tournament at the age of 17. And we almost actually won, we got second, which was really nice. And I just thought at that point, I was like, hmm, like this is like, this is pretty cool. Like just like being able to play people from other countries and just being in that, like kind of like that venue where everyone's watching you and then like you know just everyone's cheering for you and then like it's like back and forth like usa is like cheering against us like heckling us a little bit you know you yeah, know yeah, yeah. the americans are you know <laughs> they heckling us and then canadians are like supporting and funny enough my mom was actually there for that match and she couldn't even watch the match and it was so sad because we lost the third set 24 22 and i was like so upset i was so upset but even though i was upset i was still so happy because it was like my first international tournament and i was just like like there's really in my, in my, like through my feeling is like, there's no other feeling like that. Just being competing on like an international stage. It's mm -hmm. like such a nice feeling. Like mm -hmm. each time I get on court and in international scene and just like with like, you know, like so many people watching and 
just like a big venue. It's just, yeah, it feels so nice. Yeah, yeah I love it. Nice. So you went back to China again after that? Yeah, so I decided I want to go back because I felt like I wasn't good enough. So I went back and then uh, I trained, I kept training and then I actually got really bad sickness from there because I think it was very dirty. So I was like, I was there for four months, but I was sick for like two months. Yeah, it was pretty bad, but I would still train. Like I still wanted to train. So I'd be sick and I would just like, just train. I would just like try and just keep going, keep going. And I thought that maybe if I just kept like, you know, going out of the sickness would eventually go away. Yeah. But it didn't. <laughs> and then eventually I got like hospitalized in, camp oh. in, in China. Yeah, oh, it was wow. pretty bad. It got that bad. <laughs> yeah. What kind of sickness was it? They didn't know. Yeah, they couldn't tell me. Mm. It was weird. Like I got this like weird, I, I want to say like a parasite kind of nice. thing where like, mm. it was like eating away at my muscles and stuff like muscle mm. tissue or whatever and like sh stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, cause I got, I remember at uh, one point I was actually, so right now I'm like 194 pounds. I was around the same height at that time too. And then I got down to like 150 and I was just yeah. skin and bone, but man, I felt so light on my feet, but like, I was like, oh, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe I, I didn't know, right. I didn't know any better. Right. So back then I was like, oh wow, this China training is really good. But like, you know, <laughs> you're actually getting yeah. eaten by parasites. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, holy, I'm like, I'm so light on my feet. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Like I'm so fast, but like, I could not like smash Like, you know, I'd be so yeah, weak. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was so fast. I was like, yeah, I was just, it felt like, yeah, and I could like run for days. It was crazy. So maybe it was something in the food that they gave me. I don't know, like just to make me more slim. Cause a lot of the China, like the uh, people I train with in China are very skinny as well. So I just kind of compared myself yeah, to them yeah. kind of like, oh, okay. If they're skinny, I should be skinny like that too. Right. Cause man, they could run. Yeah. They could run for days. Yeah. So then, yeah, I went to, yeah, I did that. And then when I came back uh, to Canada, my mom realized, okay, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> like you, you, know, you shouldn't be like this. And then I, I realized, yeah, like. I had some sort of sickness and then I went to the doctor and then they just prescribed me some antibiotics and I had to rest for like around like two weeks. I rest for two weeks. I couldn't like really do anything. And yeah, like uh, at that point I, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do after like mm -hmm. I trained because I did try playing a couple of tournaments like internationally for singles and it wasn't, it didn't go so good. Like I, I didn't, I didn't, I, w I wasn't like, I guess I could say like, just like not being able to kind of compete Can internationally be, yeah. for singles. So at least that's what I thought. And then, so then I just tried like playing uh, doubles and mixed. And then I kind of just like, after that, I just stopped playing. I just coached. So that's okay. like my first kind of retirement Stop. kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. What age was that? Um, Around 18, 19, yep. around there. Yeah, that was like kind of my first retirement. And that was mainly because you didn't think you were good enough? Yeah, that was basically it. Like I, cause I, I was thinking, I'm like, you know, I just trained in China for like eight months and I'm still losing to like maybe like American players. Cause I played the LA International Junior Challenge. Yeah, I just lost to like American players who don't play full time and I just kind of went full time on it. So I was thinking like, mm, maybe, you know, maybe badminton's not the way to go. So yeah, just decided to just train. No, sorry, just a coach and just like play for fun. Just like mess around, just like whenever friends wanted to play. So no like set schedule. So then I did that for a bit. And then it wasn't until I kind of got fired from uh, coaching. Yeah, I got fired from this club uh, because another they got it. They hired another coach um, that was better than me. But of course, I'm like 18, 19. I don't know much about coaching. But this guy was like 40 or 50 years old. And he's from like an import country. I won't say who it is, yeah. but uh, he's from like import. And he took I took my spot. And then the other people were like, okay, we don't need you anymore. You know, you can leave. And I was like, oh, okay. What do I do? Yeah. So then, yeah, I, at, at that point I was like, okay, I'm lost. I have nothing. I'm not doing anything. Like I don't have coaching. I Was so it like, a hard choice to like leave school initially as well? No, I did not. I was not a big fan of school. And your parents supported you with that? or? Yeah, because I think... Uh, I think they knew I wasn't good at school. Right. So then um, they were just like, oh, you want to do badminton? They're like, they were always supportive of badminton. Okay. So like, if you want to do it, yeah, just go ahead and do it. And then like, they were really supportive of me. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. you, when you picked it back up after that then? Yeah, so uh, going into that, um, so I got fired from my first club. And then, yeah, I was like kind of lost for like a month. I would just like play around and stuff. And then, so I went to this, uh, this club called Lee's Badminton. Yeah, uh, do you know where Michelle Lee's from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jennifer, yeah. So then I just kind of, I kind of played there around with my friends because my friends used to play there. And then I remember uh, my friends were still training and I already stopped and they were like, why don't you like, you know, train with us and stuff like that. You know, you still like, still play, you know, it would just, just be for fun. 
And I was like, hmm. It's like, maybe I'll ask. But you know how training is in Canada. We have to always pay for it. Right. Yeah. So, like, it wouldn't be free, right? So, I was like, hmm. Like, I don't know if, like, I want to pay for training at this point. Because at that point, I thought, like, you know, I'm not. I'm You're not finished. Yeah, I'm You're finished. Not, yeah. I'm not trying to, like, continue anymore, right? So, then my friends kept talking to me, like, yo, man, like, you know, maybe you could settle a deal with the coach or whatever. And then maybe you could, like, in return, coach for them. I'm like, okay. I'm like, say yeah. I do coach. Like training fees are crazy, right? Like how am I, I'm gonna have to coach like crazy hours just to like break even. Break even. So then we kind of went to the coach and we talked to like, oh, you know, like he's not financially like the best and then he can still play and stuff like that. So the coach is just like, oh, okay, you can come a couple times a week just to like, just to see oh, how it goes. Oh, yeah, 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 just like see how it goes, you know, like no commitment and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, that sounds pretty good. I'll just come. Cause I still liked playing the sport, but it was just, money issues right you know like mm -hmm. there's no it's so hard to make money in uh, badminton in canada so i played and i trained at least for a bit and then kind of like a couple months in the coach kind of saw potential in me but she saw potential in me uh so this is jennifer lee i'm sure you guys know who jennifer lee is right i've heard of is she michelle lee yeah michelle lee's coach. yeah yeah Previous. so then yeah, yeah she was like she saw potential in me to like keep training so she's like i see potential in you and i was like oh, okay cool She's like, I see potential you in singles. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, you know, cause at that point I thought my singles was just like, you yeah. know, you know, trash. So I, I didn't think I was gonna, she's like, yeah, I actually see potential for you to be like a good singles player. And I was just like, like, really? I was like, I was like, but like, you know, at that point I was like, you know what, why not? You know, I'm not doing much with my life. So, uh, so I went, yeah, that's how I got back into it. Started training uh, full time again. And then with her support, she kind of supported me along the way. She was actually one of my favorite coaches to this day because she was also very straightforward. Anyone who's ever kind of talked to her knows that she's like the most yes. straightforward person. And, and I love that about her. She'll tell you straight up. She's like, someday she'll come in. She'll be like, you're doing leg, like only leg work, like footwork for like the whole two hours because your legs are not good enough. Just like just stuff <laughs> like that. And I'll be like, okay, I'll be like, all right, I, I trust you. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. You know, just like that. Or like, she's like, you're going to do like whip smash or whatever, something like that. You know, for like an hour straight because you literally can't do it. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, that sounds good. Like, it's perfect. Like, you know, she didn't really beat around the bush, which is uh, like, I really respect. Some like coaches like, you know, that I've been with before, they would kind of like be soft on you and stuff like that. But that's not going to like work, right? If you be soft, I'm not going to get it. Yeah. You guys have to like, like go straight to it and just like tell me how it is, right? So I did that for a bit. I trained singles for a bit. And uh, I was getting pretty, uh, I felt like I was improving a lot and got pretty decent at it. And then... I realized at one point that uh, I was also, there was also a financial issue again. So then I was trying to go and play tournaments, but I could barely afford to even play tournaments in Canada just to travel. So then I realized at that point, I was like, hmm, like, I don't think I can do this. Like I even told her, I was like, I know you're like helping me just for like the training and aspect and that stuff. But like, I actually don't have enough money to even travel in Canada. So how am I even going to go internationally? Right. So then I told her that she understood and I was like, all right, like, I'm going to retire again. <laughs> so then uh, I retired for a couple months and then my mom actually just moved to Hong Kong. So she moved to Hong Kong and then she asked me to move with her to Hong Kong, but I said, no, I want to stay in Canada. So then I stayed in Canada and I realized once again, I didn't know what to do with my life. <laughs> I was just like, hmm, I guess like I'll just keep coaching and then see where like life takes me. And then I actually almost went to college. Yeah. But then, uh, fun fact, I went to orientation and then I like was listening on for a couple hours of what I was going to do in my program. And then I went straight to the principal's office and told me I'm pulling You're out. Not. Yeah, I'm pulling out because what? I, because I just knew like right away after sitting there and just like, I'm just like, I'm like, gonna, this is only two hours. Like yeah, I do this yeah, for four years. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, <laughs> I'm here for two hours and they're telling me all that I need to do. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to do this to my full potential. I'm going to half ass it so hard. And I knew, like, I just knew I wasn't ready for it. So like, it's better. Like personally, if I'm going to like go into something, I'm going to go in like hundred hundred percent. Right. Like I knew right then and there, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to like skip. I'm going to skip class. Skip class yeah. I'm going to like, you know, I'm just going to not listen to the teacher. I'm just, I'm not going to do this properly. So I didn't want to, Waste kind of time. waste my time and money, and money to go to school. So then I pulled out. Luckily, I got like, you know, all my money refunded, which is nice. <laughs> that would have been bad. That was a, a bit of money there. So then, yeah, that, that also kind of hit hard because uh, I knew I wasn't ready for school and I wasn't doing anything with my life kind of thing. So I was just kind of coaching and just like going with the flow with life, which is mm. And you're like 20 at this point? At this point, I'm 20. Yeah, yeah. 20. Yeah. 
So then... How old are you now, by the way? 25. 25, yeah. Yeah. So then, yeah, I was just doing that. And then I actually went to Hong Kong to visit my mom in around September, October of my uh, of that year when I was 20. And then I was playing badminton. I was playing around and then I met someone's mom whose son was training with the Hong Kong team. So then uh, she actually just randomly came up to me and then was just like, hey, like, you know, like uh, my son's part of like the Hong Kong team. And she's like, would you consider like um, just going and training with them? And I was just like, I'm like, what do you mean? Like, like with the Hong Kong team? Like, I was just like, yeah, like I know the coach. It's like, I can like talk to him and you could probably just like train there. I told her about my life, like where I was in life. And she's like, yeah, like if you just want to train there and then, you know, maybe coach in Hong Kong kind of thing. Because coaching in Hong Kong, you make pretty good money. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you could just do that. And then like, see where like, you know, just to have some, something to do or like, you know, maybe find some sort of like opportunities through badminton because badminton in Hong Kong is very big. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll try it out. She's so like, uh, I went and then I just went to go train with them. And then I was talking to the coach and the coach thought I was like, you know, pretty chill. And then like, you know, I was like training hard and stuff still. So he's just like, yeah, like if you want to come back and train with us, like at, like at any time you can like come back. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, like, yeah, that's, that's that's like really cool. So then I, I, got to, I got to just like train with them anytime I wanted. So I went back to Canada after because I was just there for vacation. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm back moving. into it yeah i'm back into <laughs> it but this time i'm moving to hong kong it's oh, like wow. it's so crazy right because i just like last time i only went for maybe i went for like a month or two and i really liked it so i was like okay like i'm, I'm down to live here you know so <laughs> so uh yeah so then for around like a year a year and a half to two years i was just training with them but the one thing that was strange was that in hong kong i would get injured very easily i'm not sure why like when i was there for maybe like I was training for maybe like a year and a half, uh, maybe like half of that time I was injured. Oh wow! Yeah, like I would have like I would have like my arm injured, my leg, like my ankle, my knees, my back. I was like I was always getting injured. It was so strange. Maybe you're growing more. Maybe I'm growing more. Actually, no, I I didn't stop growing until I was like 22. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so maybe. maybe, but but it was so strange. I was like I don't get injured this often in um in uh. In Canada. in Canada or yeah. in China before that. Yeah. No, in China, I did get injured, but oh, it wasn't as frequent. Like okay. I was like, damn, I think maybe I'm getting, maybe my body just can't handle it. Mm. Right. So then uh, it was like, I was just getting little injuries here and there, but I would heal maybe a month, heal maybe like two weeks and stuff like that. So then I would just like, I was like, you know what? I can still do it. You know, I can still see, see where this takes me. Right. So then it wasn't until I actually got a really bad injury when I was doing smash training. And then I felt like a pop in my elbow, like right here right into this like uh kind of like the golfer's elbow yeah. area that was pop and i and i immediately dropped to the ground like it was painful and then like it was like a loud pop so like everyone around me just like turned and looked right and they were like oh shit what the fuck what? just happened yeah. oh sorry actually can i not swear on this <laughs> <laughs> can i swear on this podcast <laughs> yeah but like yeah <clears throat> we just mark it as explicit <laughs> okay okay just like bleep it out <laughs> so like oh what just happened <laughs> so then so then I, yeah, I went to the doctor and they, they found out that like my arm basically like, exploded, like all the tendons, the ligaments, like Just muscle. ruptured. Don't yeah, it was like, no, it all like tore in my elbow, right? So then uh, the big thing that I didn't realize, because I just iced it after. I didn't know what was, and I waited maybe two or three days before going to the doctor. And I didn't realize that my bone was actually dislocated the whole time. So like it was weird because I was in bed and I, and I wouldn't be able to strain my arm. And I was just like, what's wrong with my arm? Like, it's like really, like it's really yeah. messed up. <laughs> so, mm. so I was like, what's wrong with my arm? So then I went to the, I just went to the doctor and she like, she, she looked at it and she didn't say anything. She just took my arm and just like popped it like this. Uh, and I was no just like, warning. And I got no just warning, right? No warning. She yeah. popped it. And I was just like, no, I was just shocked. I was like, cause I heard a pop too, right? Like it just went back into place. And I was just like, oh, I can straighten my arm again. Yeah. I was just like, wait, it feels amazing. Like, I was like, <laughs> I was like Let's what's going train. on? Yeah. No, and then, uh, and then she's just like, oh yeah, your, your, your bone was like, misplaced or whatever i just popped it back in i was like thank you for not telling me before <laughs> <laughs> because i would have been so been freaking out yeah i would have yeah. been like holy that's would have been crazy so so then yeah she's like yeah but uh the one thing is is that um she took some like mris or like kind of like ultrasounds or i'm not sure like she took like a bunch of tests and she told me like yeah your muscle is torn your ligaments are like misplaced They're, some of them are torn like it was like really messed up like i was scared i was like damn how did i mess myself up this bad so at that point um she said, give it a month. Don't play any badminton for a month and then see if it still hurts. So I stopped for a month and then I tried playing and I could like, 
barely like hold my racket. I couldn't even like grip anything with yeah. I couldn't even brush my teeth. Like that's how bad it was. Couldn't use chopsticks. I had to use a spoon. You know, you white guy. Why, why, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, I, it, it's so embarrassing when you go to a restaurant and then like someone's just like, uh, someone's like, oh, sorry, everyone's like using chopsticks and then like you're the only white guy and then they're like, <laughs> like I know how to use chopsticks, but, but I, I just, I, I just can't. can't. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I just physically can't. And I have to be like, hey, can I get a spoon? And then she looks at me. She's like, ah, oh, <laughs> these guys. I get you a spoon. These, yeah, okay, these. These guaylos, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that, yeah, that was like that was an uh, embarrassing part of uh, having this injury. But uh, yeah, so I tried getting back into it, and then I realized I couldn't even like hit clears. The only thing I could do was probably hit drops. And so it was like it was like that for maybe two, three months, and it just like wouldn't heal. So then I went to a different doctor, and they told me like if you want to kind of use your arm again, you either have to stop for like maybe six months to a year, or and then like after that, you will still feel pain, yeah. but you're able to like get a bit of your strength back or you get surgery, but you have to stop for like a long time. Like, and then your arm won't be the same as before. I was just like, huh. Not very, two not very good choices. Yeah, so I was just like, hmm, I guess I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, so then I was just like, okay, you know what? Like at that point, I'm like, badminton is not for me. Like, you know, I, I just thought at that point, I'm like, I am like, I gave it so many chances, like, this is not for me. <laughs> so at that point, uh, I stopped and then I just like kind of coached in Hong Kong and then I was just going with the flow again, just like, you know. Could you feed the shadows properly? Yeah, but it would hurt. It would yeah. hurt a little bit. Like I have to wear a brace, which is really also really like embarrassing. It's just like you're wearing a brace and you're like, what? Feeding. <laughs> yeah, you're wearing a brace and feeding and you're like, what, 22? Like you're already like broken. Like I'm just like, this is so embarrassing. I was just like, well, I gotta find a way to fix this, you know? <laughs> But nobody had told you like physio exercises or like no, even your rehab kind of program for it? No, they, no, because I, I wasn't able to use my hand. Like yeah. they said, the more, like it's like overuse. Just re healing time. Yeah, it's like a stress thing. Uh, you know how like stress things, you can't like do anything yeah. with it. You just have to like literally rest, stretch a little bit. Yeah. But like how much stretching can you do, right? I'm literally in my room like this for like hours. Like what do I do? <laughs> I don't know. So then, yeah, I just like realized I'm like, okay, I guess this is not for me. And so then I went back to Canada and then this is where like I completely dropped badminton where I wasn't even playing. I was just kind of like working. I was just uh, doing, a, I was just working a bunch of jobs, just trying to like put myself out there and trying to, cause I thought I was done with badminton at that point. And this is when maybe when I was around 23, I thought I was done. So I was like, okay, I put myself out there, gonna try and find out what I want to do with my life and just find out what I like. Cause I didn't know what I liked. I did badminton my whole life. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I know. So I was like, you know, just go and do some stuff, like anything. So just did some stuff and then for maybe around a year, a year and a half. And then my dad reached out to me and was just like, hey, like, you know, if you still want to like play badminton, like he's like, he, he, he was actually the start. He started where he said, you can like, I can financially support you. And this was like mind blowing to me. He's like, You're like all these years. Yeah. He no, now you me. tell me yeah. you can support me. So no, no, this is like, yeah, this is a big thing. Cause like, I always thought badminton in Canada, if I was going to do badminton, it wasn't going to be in Canada because of financial re mm. reasons. Right. Uh, so then, yeah, my, my dad was just like, yeah, like, like I can financially support you now if you want to do it. That's only, that's only if you want to do it. And I was just like, okay. So then I was just like, no, <laughs> at first I said, no, I was like, no, I'm done with this sport. Like my arm is messed yeah, up. Yeah. And then like, I, I've tried already. I've went to China. I've trained like so hard. I trained to like, I literally want to like cry <laughs> to the point. And I just can't, like, I can't do it. So then I told him no. And then maybe like a couple days later, he's like, Hey man, like, if you want to do it, you can do it. <laughs> like, he's really trying to like, not put too much pressure, like directly, but he's just like, I think you could do it. Like, if you want to keep doing it, you know, I was just like, no. So then. What's funny was uh, he kept like pushing me and also a, another, per, another another friend of mine, uh, Duncan Yao, he uh, heard that I was back in Canada and he asked me to play doubles uh, just for fun. They just like play some tournaments in Canada. And I was like, look, man, like I have no money to do it, but uh, I actually did for my dad. So I lied to him. So he's going to find out. <laughs> yeah. now. But then uh, originally he wanted to help. <laughs> yeah. So then I just, because personally, I didn't want to do it anymore. Like yeah. I've, I've been through like everything and I just felt like, I couldn't do it anymore. Like, it just like felt hopeless. Like, what's the point? I play in Canada, you, you know, you play a tournament, you have fun, but you waste so much money. It's so much money. Like a flight to like, like to a tournament, a Canadian tournament is probably like five, 600 yeah. plus hotel, Yeah. you know? And then maybe the prize money won't even cover it. Totally. Right. Yeah. So like, what's the point? So I just told him no. 
at first. And he, a couple months later, he asked me again. He's like, hey, man, like, you still sure about like not coming back into the scene or whatever? And I was like, I'm like, nah, I don't really want to do it. You know, I'm not, not about it. So I was like that for maybe a year and a half. And then it wasn't actually until the Canadian Nationals. Uh, it was being held in Toronto. So where the city that I was from. And I was lucky enough just to have a good friend of mine, uh, Adwin Lau. I'm not sure if you guys know him, but he was kind of like a local player. And I was just like friends with him. So I kind of like picked up the, picked up a racket and played with him just a couple times. And then I think we kind of talked and we're just like, hey, you want to just like play nationals for fun? Just, just, just for fun, just like casually. And I was like, yeah, I'm down. No, no, just play for fun. Nothing like, nothing too crazy. How was your arm? At that point, at yeah, that it, it was, it was, it was rested enough. No, no, no. It, it, at that point, like I said, if I, like the doctor said, if you rest this, this, yeah. you'll still feel the pain, yeah. but you're still, you'll be able to use it like, you know, with, with like power and stuff. So at this point, my kind of like my like style of play changed a lot. Like I wasn't so much of a power player. I was kind of like more just like, you know, just yeah. hit it over and just like play more skillful. And if I ever get the lift, just like don't yeah. overdo yeah. the yeah. arm. Yeah. Cause like, the one thing about me as a player is every time I get a lip, I want to yes. crank it as hard <laughs> as I can, you know? So then I also think like the injury itself is also like a blessing in disguise because yeah. it made me change my play style into like thinking more and kind of uh, not being so much of a power player and not always the relying on like smash, cranking heavy it. Smash, yeah, yeah, heavy yeah. smash. So then, yeah, that was, that was pretty nice because I knew like as soon as I went up like this, even if I w lifted my arm like this and I pulled back a little bit, I would feel the pain already. So as soon as I go up like this, it like no. clicks in my head. I'm like, don't hit yeah, hard. Don't yeah, don't hit hard. So I was just like, so then yeah. Um, so yeah, back to the tournament. He just asked me like, you know, let's just like play to so play it for fun. I was like, yeah, I'm done. So I went to the tournament, and knowing me, I'm very competitive when it comes to like tournaments and stuff. So then when I went and I, as soon as I entered the tournament and I went into the venue a fire just like ignited in me. And I was just, I want to, I want to, I want to mess I wanna up. Win. Uh, yeah, I want to win so bad. So first round we like, we win it, but it was very close. And then like that already like spiked it, like even more, like I was like, holy, this is such a nice feeling. I miss it so much. Mm -hmm. So then unfortunately we got a really bad draw because we played uh, Neil Yakura and Jason yeah. Hoshu's second round. So like we're, we weren't going to beat them. Like we weren't, uh, we just tried to play for fun. And then, but I remember, I still remember like, uh, this also comes to another uh, another uh, person where it was um, Kevin Cal from Casey Badminton Club. So he was also at the tournament, and I remember watching the matches uh, alongside him. And he's actually he was he was a close friend of mine when he first came from China to Canada. And he always told me like he also kind of was telling me like yo man you can like you can still do it like you know if you want to come back like like his club is always open for me. So I was like man no, thanks I appreciate that but like it's not gonna happen. So then at the tournament, I was, I was, I was standing next to him and he was also enforcing it again, just like, you know, like, you know, you can still do it. Like I saw you play, like you, you still got it. And I was watching it and I was like watching all these players. I used to, I like, I played and I used to like compete against them and I see them making like semifinals and like finals and stuff. And I'm just like, I want to come back. Like, you know, it started coming back. Like I could feel this, like the fire was just like, so it was igniting, like such a fire in my, like inside of me. And I was like, man, I, I have to come back. Like I can't, like, I can't just like give it up. Like I know I can still do it. And as soon as like that day happened, I looked at Kevin. I was like, okay, I'm gonna come back. And he's just like, what? You're gonna come back? And I was like, I was like, yeah, man. Like, You've been telling me like no for like almost like six months or something. And I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna come back. I, I can't let these guys win. You know, I was getting like, I was getting super confident with myself, which is, I don't know, good or bad, depending on how you look at it. So then I messaged Duncan right away. I was like, yo, let's do it. Like, let's play. And then, so then, yeah, that's how, that's basically how I came back. So I have to thank a lot of people for that. Thank my, I gotta thank my dad, I gotta thank Kevin Cow, and I gotta thank Adwin Lau. Because if it wasn't for me going to that tournament. Yeah. And seeing and it all again. And seeing it all it. again, having my dad being able to financially back me at the beginning. And also Kevin for having given me a place to train and like kind of like feel like home. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't have been so like confident and kind of like that. Back. Yeah, and like that fire wouldn't have built up, like mm -hmm. knowing without like, you know, with all this like support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that was like kind of like how I, you know, got uh, got back into it for yeah, the yeah until now so yeah fantastic well yeah. that's that's a pretty good story i think <laughs> you, how many so four times you retired i think i counted four i think it was just like three three or two two no nah, more than two more than two well three? some it's like you some of it's kind of retire for a few yeah, months yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. just yeah. like not knowing what i wanted to do in my life 
yeah. But yeah, I'd say around like officially retiring, maybe like like where I just like did not want to completely. Yeah. Maybe just twice. Twice. Yeah. Okay. Does that kind of scare you a bit then still after? Like if you finish your badminton career, having that kind of question again looming over you or you think you have a better idea of what you might want to do or mm. haven't thought that far ahead? No, I de- yeah, I definitely thought about it. But I think now as I'm like growing older and seeing more of the world, I think I have a better idea of what I want to do after. Yeah. Sure. Which is a nice feeling because... M- my whole life, I was never sure what to do with my life. I kind of mm. just like to play sports. Yeah, and see what happens. See what happens. Mm. But luckily, my mom kind of forced me to keep badminton. So then I kind of have a path in life. Yeah. Which is good. So, Josh, that's a, like a really interesting story. <laughs> that, like we've spent the whole, basically, the whole episode talking about the story because it is so interesting. And you've quit so many times or retired. Yeah. And you're back into it because you keep loving the sport. But for the people who are listening out there, what do you feel that has helped you along the way? So I know there's been really important people yeah. that have helped you, but what are the lessons that you learned that potentially people can learn from mm-hmm. when they're in that situation or if they're struggling with the sport, if they feel they want to give up, even if they're not professional players, even mm-hmm. if they're just social players who love to play for a bit of fun, what have you learned that you can impart on them? Because you've had a pretty pretty decent journey <laughs> from Canada yeah. to China, back to Canada to Hong Kong, back yeah. to Canada. So yeah. uh, I think... A big thing that kept me going was finding ways to enjoy the sport. I think no matter what in life, you just have to enjoy it. I think if you're always so down about stuff, you're not going to like enjoy doing anything. You could literally be with your friends playing badminton, but you're not finding a way to enjoy it. You won't won't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I think enjoying it makes you want to come back and do it, do it again. Right. So I think that's a a big thing. That's a big thing. And I liked what you said before about not being able to change someone else, Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. adapting what you can change in order for you to make the situation better Mm -hmm. for yourself and get the most out of it. So yeah, that's that's also a big thing I I learned uh, at a young age is like, you can only change yourself, right? You can't change the person across from you. So that that goes for like, not just badminton, but in life, right? Like you are not gonna get along with everyone in the world, right? But you have to just find a way to make things work and just respect their way of life and how they were brought up and hopefully in the end they can respect the way that you were brought up and you know the way you are as a person sure and with the way that you were brought up as well Mm -hmm. i know we haven't touched on it too much for this podcast Mm -hmm. but just a quick word about how it was like to have those two different cultures so from mum's side the chinese side Mm -hmm. where it's so strict so straightforward so you're doing that badly Mm -hmm. so direct compared to your dad's side which haven't heard too much about Mm -hmm. what your dad's like but with the different cultures and even fitting in, say, with the Asian people or the more European people <laughs> or the Caucasian people, what have you found? How has that been a challenge for you? Uh, so, yeah, like culturally, my mom and dad are complete opposite. Like my mom is super strict, like tiger mom, you know how she is. But uh, my dad is kind of like definitely the more chill dad, European style, you know, enjoy life kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So. I think it's nice because you can get two ways of like perspective, two perspectives on like on life. So if you talk to like my mom, you should say like, you know, you have to discipline yourself, you got to do this, that. And then and my dad would be like, okay, you can't be too uptight. You got to just like, you know, you got to kind of like sit back, you know, see things like in a broad perspective, yeah, yeah. which is nice because you can actually take both very like, you can, you can use both perspectives in life. And then you can also use those in your balance and like, I would try to go, sometimes I would try to go into badminton with my mom's mindset. And then sometimes I'll go into badminton with my dad's mindset. And I feel like the game is completely different. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I do, uh, I'm fortunate to have two, have two like, different yeah. cultures. Yeah, to, exactly. Yeah. Different perspectives as well. Yeah. yeah. Did you find it difficult in terms of, so you're talking about in Hong Kong, how you were the white guy, even though you're not fully white. <laughs> yeah. So you were the white guy in the restaurant so I'll, using I'll, the spoon. I'll say something though. <laughs> the thing, the, the thing I like, bothers me is that if i'm with asian people they think i'm white yeah if i'm with white people they think i'm asian so i don't <laughs> fit in anywhere like i don't fit in anywhere unless we, we fit in together yeah i was about asian. to say so like it when i'm half asian yeah though. when i'm with a half asian then i actually feel like okay this is like this I, is my family I, yeah yeah exactly so anytime i actually meet like a half asian i like i like you know it, it's pretty cool because i know they won't like judge me as like oh you're so white oh you're, you're so, so white. Asian. yeah so asian. it's just like Come on, man. Just relax. I'm just trying to enjoy life, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, Let me be me. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. 
Do you feel that at all, Ganya? Um, I, I guess I don't really notice it too much. I mean, Australia is like so multicultural, multicultural mm -hmm. and like even in badminton scene, even though like Australia is quite Asian dominated, I don't know, like everybody's still kind of brought up Australian as well. So we feel Australian. We don't really necessarily always associate directly to just Asian or to like, Asian. yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So Josh, we've heard a lot about your story and it's a very unique story that I think a lot of the listeners who don't know you, know you a lot better now. So personally, I know you a lot better now, mm -hmm. completely. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't know you gave up that many times. Yeah. I didn't know. So wait, how's your elbow now? Oh, now it's better because I'm taking better care of it. Uh, so I realized the, the one thing, so it's actually pretty much like kind of completely healed, but the only problem is that there's like constant inflammation. So if it ever gets too inflamed, I can feel it. And then I will take like, kind of like anti-inflammatory yeah. meds or um, just kind of like take other things, like natural things like um, like ginger or like turmeric. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like those types of things, because yeah. those are like anti-inflammatory. So I'm just like um, taking care more of myself after the injury, which is also another thing, like a blessing in disguise, because now I'm actually like, I actually do a lot of research into like, you know, how to take care of my body now, Okay, which is really nice, yeah. yeah. So other than all those interesting facts about your badminton career, what would you say is something that someone listening, so even if they know you, for example, what would you say that some people don't don't know about you, even if they know you as a person? So is there a fun fact or some a dirty little secret that you can reveal for us? Dirty. Maybe not dirty. <laughs> just, 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 <laughs> dirty little secret. A PG secret. Yes, PG rated, so family, family fun rated. <laughs> Um, um hmm. secret or something funny? Jesus, I'm not that interesting, I guess. <laughs> Wasn't it already an interesting story? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting story, so. Hmm. That's a good question. Fun fact about me. Do you have something like really random that you love? What are you or? scared of? Are you scared of something that's... Bro, I'm scared of like so many things. <laughs> scared of everything? Yeah, I'm a huge pansy, man. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what it is. Even like you're... what? Animals oh, okay. Or... Yeah, we can start with... The, yeah. Oh, this is embarrassing, but I... Um, oh, okay. Now I have a fun fact. Uh, I used to be a, a model. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I used to be a model. That's actually why I got fired from my first uh, coaching job. That was a, that was the reason why I got fired because I went to a modeling competition, and then I, I um, yeah, so yeah. I used to be a model, but my mom signed me up. I went, and I thought my mom was going to tell um, my coach that I was going to my boss or whatever that I was going to go to the competition, but she didn't, and I just didn't show up to work, oh. so they fired me. Yeah. So it wasn't about the other coach coming. But it was also it. because of that. Oh, it, yeah. it gave them more legally. Yeah. Like, we don't need this guy anymore. Because I was already getting shafted. Like, I was getting less hours and stuff. But, like, you know, the modeling stuff kind of sent them over. And it was like, all right, get Did out you here. enjoy it? At first, I was like, screw this. I'm, I don't want to do this. But then I was just like, you know what? You know, might as well just go try it. And it was actually fun. Like, I met a lot of cool people in the, you know, in the competition. And I got hired afterwards, too. Nice. To become a model. What did you model? Uh, I just modeled, like... Uh, Clothes. What's that one store? Uh, like G Star? Do you know what that? Oh, is? G Star. Yeah. Like G -Star Asian Royal. brand, G Star, yeah. and like some other ones. Like I was like a one of those like online. Yeah. Oh, uh, you just like show the shirts. Show the shirts. Yeah, yeah. And oh, I was yeah, like yeah. the I was the mall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I was that. And oh then, wow. And I also did like a lot of like shows at like uh, the kind of like uh, amusement parks. I don't know, like you know like I don't know if you guys know like Canada's Wonderland. It's kind of like a I want to say like a Disney World. Mm, or just like a small version yeah yeah or like just at like water parks and stuff mm -hmm. just like do like uh just kind of like put on shows for people i was surprised people actually watch that stuff like a lot of people actually come i was surprised it was like more than badminton <laughs> so you're like performing or yeah we're like modeling clothes uh, and then we're also playing games on like stages and stuff uh, okay. and just yeah. like and people just watch you do that yeah like people would just watch us throw water balloons at each other at water park <laughs> and people were like the crowd was loving it and i was like i'm <laughs> so confused and then, yeah. and then at the end you're like buy the t-shirts and like what <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. basically yeah the t-shirt's like soaked already yeah. <laughs> like, they can't even see it so yeah that's yeah that's a fun fact about me that yeah is. awesome yeah. awesome so finishing up here what is next for you josh ah so next is well, Indonesia Masters, I guess. Yeah, Indonesia Masters, which is next week. Yes, next but week. But in terms of badminton, so it's obviously going for Tokyo 2020. Yes. So right now, that, that's been the that's been the goal is to make uh, the 2020 Olympics. It's and been... how how likely are you guys looking currently to qualify for that? Um, it's looking pretty good. Uh, it's it's kind of complicated the the whole like three different doubles teams in like three different categories. Yeah. I don't really want to go much into yeah, it, sure, but but. Uh, 
Yeah, it's looking good actually. Uh, we're out, we're on a good track. Mm. We're on a very good track, but we don't want to kind of get compl like complacent. Complacent. Yeah. yeah, we just want to keep pushing forward because I feel like uh, Josephine and I are like a pretty good team, and mm -hmm. I think we can kind of like push these top players mm. and push them to like you know take us seriously and and kind of uh, like almost overthrow some of them mm -hmm. but we're just like man there's so many tournaments when we play these top players and then we're just like so close for, to winning to winning but and we always lose just lose yeah, all, yeah every time we're always so close every time it comes really close we always like we, i don't know what happens and i think that's a uh, yeah, like a big thing with like uh our mental aspect Mentally, like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so hopefully when you get that one yeah just then all of a sudden it's through and we're gonna through, win yeah. olympics basically yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's also probably a bit an, an experience thing as well like yeah. you kind of it seems like you hadn't played that many international tournaments leading up to like the olympic qualification mm -hmm. so a lot of the top players now have been playing for like years and years and yeah. being on circuit for ages so. yeah this is just kind of like our first year yeah of yeah. playing like like this is my first time in malaysia playing malaysian yeah. masters right so like i've never been here whereas i've played it like five times already you played it five yeah, times yeah, yeah. yeah. and then oh. when you said there was the first time in malaysia i said like, to you I do even play badminton. Yeah, yeah. actually been to. And I was like, Malaysia yeah, I play, play badminton. badminton just in other countries. <laughs> just not man. in Malaysia. <laughs> just not in Malaysia. Just, How do you not play? My Malaysia? rank wasn't high enough back then. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, okay. Yeah. So if people want to follow your progress, how can they keep up with up to date with what you're doing? Oh, so I have an Instagram that I regularly, uh, not regularly, but that's where I keep most of my you know updates, updates and, and stuff. It's at Joshua, and then B H Y U. So that's where like most of my stuff is like, that's where I post most of my stuff and that's how you can follow me. Great. Yeah. Anything else to add, Gronya? My handles are just Gronya Somerville for Instagram and Gronya Somerville official for Facebook. And Gronya is releasing a YouTube channel soon. So oh, nice. Gronya Somerville. As yeah, well. just be Gronya Somerville. <laughs> uh, and yeah. just for accountability, Josh said that he might be doing oh. some training oh. stuff on, <laughs> filming some training stuff um, on YouTube maybe or Instagram. <laughs> Probably so Instagram. You can feel yeah, Instagram it's, it's just an idea. So I'm going to throw me under the bus. Come yeah, on. I'll throw him under <laughs> the bus to make him yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, good luck for the rest of the qualification period. Yeah, you too. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> see you next week in Indo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll probably see you like later today. <laughs> <laughs> so, for everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning into the Badminton Podcast. We're really excited because hopefully this week and next week, we're going to be bringing you more episodes with guests like Joshua who are playing on the professional circuit looking to qualify for the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. So if you want to get in contact with us here at the Badminton Podcast, you can contact us via our social media. Our handle is Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're on LinkedIn as well. And you can also follow the Badminton Podcast on Instagram, which the handle is the Badminton Podcast with no spaces. So tune in for the next episode and we'll have some other cool guests on. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You have to say bye. 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 This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.